Prepare yourself for the terror. The prison of madness where few enter and none return. Welcome to Unsung Horrors. With Lance. And Erica. Leave all your sanity behind. It can't help you now. Welcome to another episode of Unsung Horrors. I'm Erica. I'm Lance. And this is our end of year episode. So we're not talking about movies with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. We're talking about favorite movies that we discovered this year. First time watches, new to me, whatever you want to call them. We're going to share our five picks for the year. And along with us, our guests from last year, we've got Lindsay and Anthony. Hello. 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 Thank you for having us back, you guys. <laughs> of course. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. L- Lindsay, I-, I feel like you and I are sort of, you're Gordy and I'm Vern from Stand By Me and we're hanging out with the cool kids. Oh, and geez. I was trying to decide, are Lance and Erica Teddy and Chris or are Lance and Erica Ace and Eyeball? Oh. Like the crazy people. I, I guess I'd leave it up to you guys, but I'm definitely Vern, and Lindsay's definitely Gordy. I'm I'm, I'm a big Vern, uh, <laughs> me right here. I so. I'm pretty sure that which uh, which character is River Phoenix? Uh, that's Chris. Okay, I'm Chris. that one because he's dead. You're, you're <laughs> <laughs> always the theme. <laughs> then I'll be Teddy Duchamp. I'll be. <laughs> uh, he's, the, he's the crazy one. Okay, okay. I mean, I'm just but going I'm usually off of nice. what's I mean, more likely. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be, uh, what's the, what's the dead body's name? Uh, Brett. Yeah, Brett. exactly. Oh, right. Oh, that <laughs> should Brett, be me. Uh, why can't I think of his name? Yeah. Why can't you? That's traumatizing. Ray, you. You've talked about that before. Ray. Yeah, Ray. You know, maybe, maybe like, uh, Sam and, and John and Charles, they're like Ace and Eyeball and, uh, Billy or, you know. One of the brothers. Maybe John, they can be the the crazy people. Yeah, John is definitely the one who is. Uh, he he's the one who's like, let's go find the dead body. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't do the impression. I can't that do works. the New Jersey John accent. But uh, <laughs> I thought I thought I, he jumped on Mike and said that. So good job, Eric. I try really yeah. good job. I yeah. mean, I could ask I, him. He's in the other room. And be like John. <laughs> say, let's go find a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> I'll insert that. I'll record him later. <laughs> Do it. Um, so I just introduced you guys by names. Very rude of me. I did not say where you're from. Lindsay, Schlock and Awe podcast. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with it, tell everyone a little bit about it. Uh, it's a double feature podcast. At this point, I don't think there are any rules anymore. Uh, it's <laughs> just um, whatever double <laughs> my guest and I want to talk about. Um, but it can range from any kind of movie with any kind of movie. Um, I love mixing um, genres, um, time periods, um, anything you want. So, uh, yeah, no, but it's been so much fun and I'm, I'm still loving doing it. I'm still, I still love to do it, I should say. I just put the right words in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most awesome. important thing is loving what yeah, you exactly. do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anthony, Cult Movies Podcast. Yeah, yeah I hate it. Um, I hate, I hate what I do. I mean, no, I'm joking. <laughs> we, uh, what's great about my podcast is that it is, it's finite. There's an end. We have two movies or 200 movies to cover and then we're done. Uh, we are a podcast that, uh, talks about the movies written by Danny Perry in his cult movies books. And, uh, myself and my co-host Kristen and Vinny have guests on every week. And we have the guest pick one of the movies from the book and we did uh, talk about that and, and do some double feature recommendations as well. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I, at this point, we're wrapping up season four. And so that is 80 movies. And I feel like we've created a nice sort of recurring family of guests uh, that all, all three of you are part of, uh, which is, is really nice. And, you know, you kind of develop a rapport with your recurring guests and uh, that makes conversations flow better and it's, you know, easier, you have more fun. Uh, so I feel like it, it took four seasons to, to hit a really good stride, but like this season has flown by for me 
And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this time next year, we're going to be in the next batch of 100 movies. So that's Ooh. books two and three, which is really exciting. I can't that's wait awesome. for that. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing what comes up. We're always happy to be on on there. And I know I've been putting it off. <laughs> Our next appearance, and I feel so bad, but I promise. You have to come. I, I am saving the, <laughs> the season finale for for Lance and Eric. Ah, oh, <gasps> shit. Now there's pressure. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Fuck. Save the worst for last. We're Jesus. Just, uh, <laughs> we're just going to be like, we're just here to talk about Roger Corman again. Yeah, we got to wrap <laughs> up the, the Corman trilogy here. <laughs> Uh, I don't have any Corman on my list for this. So we'll save that conversation for when we're on Anthony's podcast uh, next yeah. month. But um, so folks, if you did not listen to our end of year episode last year, what we did is talk briefly about our letterbox stats, specifically uh, who each of our most watched actors was and uh, most watched director uh, so we're going to go round robin with those, and then we're going to circle back and do our top five film discoveries for the year, uh, or new to me. Only rule with that is no 2022 releases. Pretty self-explanatory for folks. Yeah, you got it. Uh, so we always want to start with our guest, Anthony. Who was your most watched actor this year? Well, to, to no surprise, um, it is the great Marjo Gortner. I watched yes. every single one of his movies. Nineteen. He has twenty credits on Letterbox. Mm-hmm. One is the the uh, Luigi Cozzi documentary, uh, which I didn't watch because who gives a shit? Oh, uh, I certainly don't. <laughs> uh, but I watched every single Marjo movie, and uh, I found something to love about each of those, even if it was just Marjo. But there was uh, one that was hard to track down and. Uh, My buddy Chris from Ireland found a copy in the Netherlands, a DVD. Oh, wow. And so he ordered it and had it shipped to him because the shipping would be way cheaper going to him. And then he ripped me a copy and and sent it over. And so uh, we split the cost of that DVD. Uh, When I finally watched that one, I was like, I I did it. I've never done something like this Like in, in an entire year, watched someone's filmography and granted it's only 19 movies but uh it was a hell of a lot of fun and i still i still love marjo gortner oh yeah i do too yeah (laughs) that documentary marjo is fantastic uh we both watched that for when lance picked uh hellhole hellhole yeah 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 yeah. i'll I'll forgive the uh luigi cozzi slander (laughs) and uh (laughs) we will move on to Lindsay, who was your most watched actor uh, my uh, most watched actor was the marvelous Tony Todd, uh, mm-hmm. wow. only because I decided to watch at the end of October the first three Final Destination movies, and that kind of pushed me over the edge. But he's been popping up in a, a few things I've been rewatching and uh, sort of watching, and because he's Tony Todd, he will pop up in things <laughs> like the Hatchet movies, um, Final Destination, uh, The Crow, uh, all kinds of things. So, yeah, he's he's been working around, and I'm always happy to see him. So, yeah. He's in The Rock, isn't he? Hell he yeah. Is. Is. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, he pops up yeah. everywhere. Part of yeah. F this movie fest this year. So there's there's another one for you, Lindsay. Yes, no, I actually clicked on it to see what movies I had watched. I'm like, oh, yes, I forgot I watched The Rock this year for If This Movie Fest, <laughs> which he is in. And, yeah, the candy, both Candyman's, The Crow, Final Destination, um, and some of the Hatchet movies. I'm just like going, yeah, been good year if Tony Todd's um, popping up. <laughs> nice. Lance, what about you? Uh, mine. Mine is Rose Albanieri. Oh, big surprise. Yeah. It's a huge surprise. <laughs> yeah, she was in a few of my movie picks for our podcast. Uh, the first of the year was uh, Giallo January. And I picked Smile Before Death. And then she was in our last episode, Lady Frankenstein, directed by the great Mel Wells. There's our Roger Corman. Uh, there you go. Oh, there it is. Right yep, there it is. There yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I did a lot of research for both of those movies, watched a lot of her films. I mean, as soon as I started watching her in January, it was in a creepy manner. I was like, she's going to be my most watched actor this Ew. year. No. Now you sound like that producer who like started a production company just for her. Uh, I am Harry Cushing, but I am not part of the Vanderbilt family. I am just some gross (laughs) man who loves Rose Albanieri. Uh, 
but no, yeah. I mean, obviously she's incredibly captivating and I just love all the genre films that I've watched this past year. Uh, Slaughter Hotel, obviously the movies we covered. Yeah. We got to say this was an exclamation uh, point. A muck. A muck. Yes. Sorry, we, I missed it. We didn't do it together. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. We'll, we'll work on that. Uh, the French Sex Murders, Jess Franco's uh, Lucky the Scrutable, which was a lot of fun, kind of like this 007 Italian uh, character. Uh, the Devil's Wedding Night, which I talked about a lot in Lady Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, everything she's in is really great. I mean, my most top, or my top four most watched actors were actually all women this year, which which oh, I thought was amazing. Awesome. Carla Mancini, oh, wow. Carla, yeah, yeah. Every, year. Neri, every Car- fucking year, Carla Mancini. She I mean, pops not, up not in everything. <laughs> Carla Mancini, Barbara Boucher, uh, and Dee Wallace. So it was oh, a great, okay. great year. Nice. What about you, Erica? Who's your most watched actor? My most watched was almost uh, because of John, because he was trying to make. <sighs> Uh, Lo Lee, his most watched actor for uh, the year. And so I had to do uh, a couple of last minute movies to make sure that he and I did not have the same one. <laughs> uh, well, they were tied. It was tied between uh, Lo Lee and this guy and also podcast related. Um, RIP to the great Henry Silva was my most watched actor for this year. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, the King. Yes. Yeah. A lot of uh, great movies. A few that were first time watches for me. Bulletproof, which was part of June's Exploitation, Trapped, which we did for the podcast. Mm-hmm. The Tall T was a first time watch for me, and I loved it. Uh, Freehand for a Tough Cop, great Polizio Tecci. And then there was a few that I watched uh, kind of more recently when I was like, oh, shit, I can't make Lowly my most watched actor. Not like I would be mad about that. I just don't want to have the same as John. But <laughs> there's this one, Killer versus Killers, is it killer versus killer or killers? I don't remember what it was. Anyway, it's a Fernando de Leo movie. It is certainly not a great Fernando de Leo movie, but it is goddamn entertaining because <laughs> it's got Henry Silva holding this grenade launcher, blowing people up. He's got a pet cheetah that he sicks on goons. I mean, awesome. it's, it's so much fun. Um, I, I love that movie. And then there was this other great movie that he did called uh, shoot from 1976. That was kind of like a, a little bit like deliverance in a way. These, these, these hunters go out into the woods to, you know, be assholes and hunt. And then they encounter this other group of hunters. And there's this like weird standoff across the river between the two. And they just start, start shooting for no reason. And so then it turns into what you think is going to be this fully like paranoid. They're going to come after us because our guy shot them and and this and that. And, and then it turns in this full, like toxic masculinity. Like we got to get the fucking army together. To <laughs> bang. It's, it's nuts. So I really, yeah. Shoot. Uh, 1976. That was really good. So anyway, Henry Silva, RIP, mm-hmm. great man and everything he's in. So let's circle to director Anthony. All right. You guys are going to be so proud of me. Ooh. So la- last year it was Ingmar Bergman, right? Mm-hmm. And I was yeah. like, oh, wow. I, I was almost embarrassed to say that on this podcast. I'm like, I'm hanging out with the cool kids. And here I am dropping Ingmar Bergman. But, There's nothing um, wrong with Bergman. I mean, yeah. Bergman. I don't need, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't I, that guy sucks. Come on, guys. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> oh, no, overrated. Of course not. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. he's like my favorite director. Anyways, I watched... 12 Lucio Fulci movies this year. Hey. Hell yeah. Yay. Fulci. And like I Fulci is not someone that I, I'm new to. I've watched you know I'm I'm almost complete I've almost completed his filmography. But as I'm looking at the list of movies that I watched it you know for June exploitation mm-hmm. there's the Lucio Fulci day, right? Right. On his birthday. Mm-hmm. But that month that after this movie or that that week I had written like five underseen Fulci movies. And so I wrote up five of those that I had to watch that I'd never watched before. So it was like House of Clocks and Sweet House of Horrors, um, Enigma, Demonia, and They Died With Their Boots on Silver Saddle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The house movies were, I, I love those. those. Have you guys seen those yet? I like the House of Clocks a lot. And then yeah. 
The other one had really annoying kids in it, so I the did kids not are, care yeah. for that one. Right. <laughs> to be um, fair, that is a poultry staple. <laughs> that's, yeah, exactly. That's Those true. ones especially so. In that movie, I was like, look, I can tolerate Bob any you, day, but like... And, and that's funny, because one of them is Bob, I, I think. It's the kid that plays Bob. <laughs> I mean, like, the okay, quintessential Bob. <laughs> right, yeah, right. But, and then in October... Every Saturday, I did a, a director series, filling in blind spots for directors, and I wanted to do more Fulci. So I watched uh, The Devil's Honey, Lizard and Woman's Skin, Cat in the Brain, and The Psychic. Mm. And uh, I was most excited about Devil's Honey. Hell yeah. And Get that saxophone out, baby. Sex. Oh, out. yeah. What a piece of shit that movie is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I fucking hated it. That movie's uh, deranged. And so, Ouch. And, and that, that, that's the first one I, I watched. I was like, oh, this is not a good omen for the rest of the day. And then I followed that up with Lizard, which is a near masterpiece. And then Cat in the Brain, which I loved. Yeah. That's super, super weird and like really gross. I think that's the, I would say Cat in the Brain is probably his goriest movie, which is saying something. Like he has all sorts of nasty squishy stuff in that movie but i was super bummed about devil's honey because uh, i just it wasn't what i thought i built it up to be this thing because when severin put that blue out a few years ago mm. everybody's like oh my god this move the saxophone and everything and then it happens at the beginning i'm like yeah here we go and then the rest of it i was like ah, this is not interesting at all so anyways <laughs> It's just I know, like a shitty I, relationship. You're just following yeah. like these yeah, exactly. people. <laughs> and I, yeah. I know a lot of people love that movie, but you know, not for me, as they say. Oh no, had Devil's, uh, Devil's Honey, I needed a shower afterward. Like I was like, oh, I was not expecting it to, I mean, I knew about the saxophone, but I was not expecting this shitty relationship and this tortured woman and sort of what everything was going on. I'm like going that, like, yeah, I don't think the saxophone is the craziest thing about this movie, but no, um, I kind of like it, but you, I definitely went, okay, I actually need to go have a shower. <laughs> to watch, it's, to it's, watch it off me. It's funny because uh, New York Ripper is my favorite Fulci. And I mm. watch that at least once a year. And like, that is, I think his most brutal and like meanest movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but these people, I just hated these fucking people in Devil's Honey. It's like, why are you together? Just both of you die, please. So, <laughs> uh, but Lizard and Woman's Skin, good follow up, save the day. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm. All right. Uh, Lindsay, what about you, director? Uh, I have a tie. Uh, both Ooh. seven movies each. Uh, probably one is my comfort director, the other one was a new one. Uh, first one is my comfort director, Wes Craven, because apparently I can't stop watching the screen movies when I'm sad. But <laughs> a, kind of my cool pick is Ernest, Ernest Lubitsch, who uh, 1930s, 40s, uh, sex comedy director. I think it's probably the only way I could describe it, but classy. Um, but no, he was, I just went on a binge of his this year and just had an absolute ball with he uh, Heaven Can Wait, uh, Trouble in Paradise, Design for Living, which I've seen a couple of times. I'm starting to work that once a year. The Smiling uh, Lieutenant, To Be or Not To Be, N Nikita, uh, butchering that. Yeah, all these kind of movies. And um, they are just kind of like these very such saucy, so um, modern, everyone's fucking in these movies, even Heaven Can Wait, which is like a pristine <laughs> kind of drama um, with uh, Donna, Donna Michi. Uh, everyone's still fucking. I kind of fell in love with what you think is a kind of a stuffy thirties director and you watch his movies and you're like, Oh no, this is not it. <laughs> Super awesome. horny guy. <laughs> <laughs> Very horny. So horny. <laughs> nice. Love the low key horny. Yes. <laughs> not the opposite of devil's honey, but the horny is still definitely there. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. I would love to see Ernst Lubitsch's devil's honey. Yes. <laughs> 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 All right, Lance, what about you for director? Okay, so I'm going to leapfrog my top director or most watched director. It was Julia Questi, mm. but I logged, what, 10 films, but he only has three features in total. Right. So I logged all his shorts. I know some are against doing that on Letterboxd. I'm, I'm not anymore. I'm not. What, how do you oh, guys so feel about that? Okay, so, I mean, if here, here's what I kind of came to because in January I watched – probably 30 Stan Brackage movies, mm -hmm. but a lot of them are 60 seconds, 75 seconds long. And I'm like, I, I don't like, I could beef up my numbers big time with this, but so I 
I think probably around summertime, I decided, okay, I'm going to log any short because I watch a lot of shorts every year. Mm-hmm. I'm going to log any short that's 10 minutes or longer and anything less, I'm just going to click, you know, the heart and the eyeball. Right. right. So that, that's mm-hmm. sort of how I, but yeah, if we're doing like Brackage is definitely my most watched director, but a lot of those are like less than a minute long. Mm. Yeah. Questies are about, I mean, his are about 20 minutes and up. Some of them are, they might even cross over 40 minutes, which with like festival standards, I think over 42 minutes, 45 minutes is considered a narrative right. at that point. But right. mm. I'm going to, I'm going to move on to my next guy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ted V. Michaels. Of course. So, both uh, of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her, Erica's favorite. Uh, both of these guys are, you know, Julia Questy did Arcana, which wasn't my pick. Uh, great episode. Great movie. Everybody should listen to the episode, too. <laughs> <laughs> but Ted V. Michaels, uh, yeah, he he's here because I picked uh, Blood Orgy of the She-Devils for our April Showers <laughs> of Blood uh, month. And I just dove into his filmography hard. Too hard. Way too hard. Good his Lord, his <laughs> films are terribly fun. Just, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, he's, I mean, he's a DIY guy doing it all, writing, editing, cinematography, mm. acting. You know, he's – but I didn't watch – not only did I watch a lot of his movies, uh, I listened to and, and watched a lot of his interviews from throughout his career. And that's what really made him so – that's what made his enjoyable is very uh, his uh, his movies very enjoyable and entertaining mm-hmm. and basically endearing because he was so passionate about making films you know no matter the circumstances financial constraints uh, i mean he was just this independent filmmaker through and through which i just i loved so yeah the corpse grinders the astro zombies and the two mini sequels after that the doll squad <laughs> 10 violent women i think most most people would shrug off a lot of his movies as a term he hated, trash cinema. Right. Yeah. I mean, I found everything so endearing, especially learning how he made these and that he just devoted his whole life to it. So I know his movies aren't for everybody, but uh, I'm happy he's he's up on my list. I watched The Corpse Grinders earlier this year. And um, uh, yeah, just terrible movie. But yeah. I had fun with it because it was like midnight, I think, when I started it. And, and you know what, it's almost uh you know a little over an hour right yeah yeah and um, sure. yeah you know it's schlocky fun but the a couple of years ago Lindsay and i did um a show for our friend brent where we talked about movies from 1966 and he did one called the black Klansman, yeah which yeah. we watched for that and that's a interesting movie from 1966 like taking some big leaps i feel like yeah no i, I didn't watch the black Klansman actually I watched. Uh, a, it was a more it's serious, it. yeah. more mm. serious movie, "Strike Me Deadly," which Erica hated. Oh, that was like this kind of weird love triangle, like with the forest fire going on, and this. The, there was- <laughs> just kept jumping back and forth. I'm like, "Fucking movie, tell your story in a straight line. Come on, <laughs> right. you're not you're not interesting enough to." It was no, <laughs> no. It really worked for me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I need to check out the the Black Klansman. All right. Director for me, I guess we're going to reignite the debate about shorts um, and (laughs) logging those because, and I will say this, I don't think we, you should be able to log TV shows on Letterboxd. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I think it should be for films Mm. only. And I do think that short films should be included. Anthony, I'm with you that if it's like 10 minutes or longer, it's worth logging, but less than that, I would make, I would probably do the exact same thing and just put the eyeball and, a yeah. heart or no heart, depending on mm. how I felt about it. Yeah. Um, because mine would have either been, it was, would have been, I had a four way tie at one point for directors because I didn't have one far and away. I had a lot of directors who I was like five films and then even more directors at four films like Ted V. Michaels. I had four films, but mm. my five film directors were Diodato, NG Mount and Kwe Chi Hung, which were all podcast related. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was a fourth one and I was like, I made the conscious decision this week to make, to watch another film by him to make him my most watched director this year. And that's Buster Keaton. Okay. Oh, fucking A. Mm. Yeah. So, and, mm. and a lot of those were short films, but essentially what prompted it was, you know, there was a new book put out this year by Dana Stevens called the cameraman. It's an excellent book. 
She that is came, an excellent book. Yes. Yeah. She came to Austin Film Society for a Q&A after a screening of The Cameraman. Uh, and John and I went to that. And and just after that, all I wanted to do was just watch way more, was just watch more Buster Keaton. I even watched one during Horror Gives Back, The Haunted House, which wasn't yeah. technically a horror film. But I was like, I'm counting it. It's called The Haunted House. And this is a haunted house category. It so. absolutely worked. It does. Mm. It works because we say it does. Yeah, exactly. Uh, our podcast, our rules. So, uh, yeah, Buster Keaton was mine. And um, I no regrets on that. Completely probably different than what anyone would expect from me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, a, not a lot of dead children in Buster there Keaton There are no movies. dead children in a Buster <laughs> Keaton movie that I have found you know, yet. If anyone knows of any, let me know. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've only seen Sherlock Jr., which he directed and started, and... Mm-hmm the cameraman, which he didn't direct. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, man, I need to up my Keaton because both of those are masterpieces and they're hysterical. And I'm like, why don't I watch more Keaton? Because he's obviously a genius. Yeah. You know, well, so. like the stunts pulled off too. It's like, yep. especially like in the general with the the train and him right. throwing those logs off. I mean, yeah. it's some um, of the camera incredible. cuts and like the, the quote unquote effects that he was able to pull off for his time are insane. Yeah. You know, I found myself rewinding. I was like, how did he do that? And yeah. that's in a film that's over like a hundred years old. And I'm yeah. questioning how somebody did something. Ah, <laughs> uh, I mean, right. yeah, he broke his back. And I think Sherlock, was it Sherlock Jr.? Sherlock Jr. Was Jr. It? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Sherlock Jr. Yeah. Um, he just says, Oh, I had this neck pain like 12 years ago. Yeah. Cause you broke it. <laughs> <laughs> He was just the kind of guy who would sleep it off for two weeks and then just go back and do it again. I mean, he, he's absolutely incredible. Yeah. All right. So let's get into our film picks for this year. Uh, Anthony, what is your first new to you? Okay. So l- let me um, clarify something. So this past month, I've sort of gone through this existential crisis with my movie watching. I read uh, Jonas Mikas's movie journal and it's a it's like a compilation of all of his uh writings from when he wrote at the village voice Mm -hmm. and i just fell in love and the way he talked about movies and how and in art in general just really fucked me up and i was like okay so i nuked all of my star ratings on letterbox and went through like the 2000 whatever however many movies i'd logged and got rid of all the star ratings and then decided at the end of the year, because I'm doing this, I'm going to do two for cult movies and I'm writing a list for F this movie. I'm going to do different lists for each of those. And what's great in the past, what I would do, I would just go on letterbox and like organize highest star rating to lowest and just pick, you know, the, the 10 highest. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And then call it good. But this, I have had to go back through everything that I've watched this year and say, do I remember this? Did it move me? Do I think about it still? And then it, if it kind of checks those boxes, it goes on to preliminary list. And then uh, I sort of whittled it down for this. And for this show, I'm doing sort of genre quote unquote genre movies, Westerns, action, adventure, because I'm still trying to figure out what's going to go on the other list. Um, So these aren't really ranked necessarily. And so I'm just, I'm going to list them off like chronologically. So I'll start with the, you know, with the oldest movie. And I I don't know what the hell crawled up my ass. And I was like, (laughs) nope, I'm watching movies wrong. I'm looking at paintings wrong. I have to rethink how I, view art so anyways uh you know i turned 40 this year maybe that's part of the midlife crisis i don't know who the ask fuck lance is. he's super old he can tell you uh oh, yeah. yeah i have no problem with subjective ratings <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, <laughs> you guys i mean my ratings make no sense whatsoever i know that yeah. and and i i mean i do agree with you uh anthony i'll like rewatch something and and I'll be like, how the hell, why the hell did I give it either such a high rating or such a low rating? And what was I thinking? I question these a lot, but at the same time, I'm like, you know what? It's just how I feel at the moment. I could have been having a good day, a bad day. Mm-hmm. It's right. it, there's, there are so many elements that does your right affect your judgment of the art you're looking at that you probably shouldn't be taking into consideration if you're in a bad mood, if, if you're in a 
too good of a mood if you're eating edibles, if you're, you know, there's, I got one of those movies on, on my list. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I, I'm old, but I, I get it. But I, again, I have no problem throwing, throwing out stars and, and orange hearts. On yeah, the and, uh, yeah. I know, I know most people don't. And I've, I like, I give a shit what anyone else does. This is just for me. I still give right. hearts. If I like the movie, I'll give it a heart. Um, if I didn't, it doesn't get a heart, but it, it was a nice exercise going back and actually looking at what did I watch this year and think, oh, fuck, I completely forgot about that because I watched that in January, but I still think about that constantly. So yeah. I'm going to talk about that on this show. Anyways, right. so my first one is one I just watched maybe a month ago for my show, and it's from 1953, The Naked Spur directed by Anthony Mann yeah. and uh, it's one of his James Stewart Westerns, but it's uh, you know, it's, it's a small cast. So it's Jimmy Stewart and then it's Ralph Meeker, uh, Millard Mitchell are the good guys. And then Janet Lee and Robert Ryan are the baddies. And it is so Robert Ryan is, I'm realizing how fucking great Robert Ryan was of a, of an actor the he's the first time we meet him in this movie, he's just laughing and like, he is completely deranged and crazy. And what I loved about watching a bunch of Anthony Mann Westerns is seeing how he sort of flipped the John Wayne, Howard Hawks, John Ford type of American Western trope, uh, cowboy, on its head and said, uh, these are like very flawed, very broken, very emotional, uh, vulnerable men. And I'm going to show that. And who better than Jimmy Stewart to do that? So, you know, it's a revenge movie. He's going to find the guy who, who killed his dad. And, uh, he comes up, you know, it's Robert Ryan and and uh, as he's looking for him, he comes across Ralph Meeker and, and Millard Mitchell. And they sort of tag along and they say, okay, we're going to help you out and hunt this guy down with you. And Robert Ryan has um, essentially kidnapped Janet Lee. And she's, she's bad, but, you know, she's kind of forced to be in that position. Um, and then the, it, the ending, it's all about the ending in The Naked Spur. And it's this... Uh, duel between your good good guy and your your bad bad guy and uh it, man i fucking loved this movie so much and uh i definitely want to go down the anthony man rabbit hole and just watch everything he ever directed yeah the man from laramie if you haven't seen that that one is another jimmy stewart yep J -J -J jimmy stewart, <laughs> <laughs> That's jimmy stewart. Uh, but that that one I, lo I love the naked spur too anthony but uh the man from laramie really did something for me like i i just loved it so yeah so that, that's out. that's one i haven't seen yet yeah, I was just trying to remember if I'd seen The Naked Spur or not. I don't think I have because I've seen a few mans, like the man, definitely from The Man from Laramie, which is really good. But what I love about Man's movie is is that he kind of shows that living in the West was really hard. Like just to get anything anywhere was just such this uh, traumatic kind of experience as well as everything else that's going on in the movie. So, yeah, no, I, Anthony Mann is fantastic. Yeah, I watched Bend of the River the same day I did a, a Man triple or quad mm. and bend of the river is like that perfect story. Like these people have to travel, you know, they're doing the Oregon trail. Right. And yeah, like they fucking get all their shit hijacked in this California town and they're up there setting up camp and this guy's not sent. It's this whole stressful thing. I'm like, Oh, I would die. I wouldn't survive a fucking day in the wild west. <laughs> There's no way I would survive out there. I was probably thinking of the, the bend of the river for that exact thing. But yeah, I, I would not yeah. do well. <laughs> I'd be out in an hour. I'd try to pet a rattlesnake or something. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's one of the bad ones. I'd eat I every guess. berry off every tree. That's, yeah. that's yes. cool. Lance has died of dysentery. Yeah. I would be dying of some disease that was cured 100 years ago. And put me out in the wild. <laughs> so just no. No camping, no Wild West, no none, none of it. You caught cholera? Nobody's had cholera for 150 years. <laughs> like, well, I'm dying of it, so bye. <laughs> Anthony got it, yeah. <laughs> All right, Lindsay, what about you? What's your first pick? 
Um, for my first pick, I might as well also go for my Robert Ryan movie, a movie I watched yesterday, but mm. because it was uh, written by Andre Polanski, who also wrote an uh, wrote and directed an amazing movie called Force of Evil, which I watched yes. two days after. Which I watched two days after that we did this. I was like, oh my god, this is my favorite discovery of the year. So Sweet. I definitely got in the Odds of Tomorrow, directed by Robert Wise, but um, written by um, Andre. P- Blonsky, I think I'm butchering his name, uh, from 1959. Uh, this is an incredible noir. It was actually produced by uh, Harry Bolo Belafonte's uh, production company, which he stars in. It also has uh, Robert Ryan and Ed Begley. It is a fantastic heist goes wrong movie. It's a noir, so you kind of already know where it's going. You know this is not going to end well. But the way it does and the performances from Belafonte and especially Ryan, I mean, Ryan is playing the biggest uh, – He's sympathetic to a point, but he just keeps doing things. I'm like, oh, dude, if you just, okay, make better choices. Um, but it also stars um, Shelley Winters, again, not doing very well in love. I love the fact that her thing in the 50s was choosing bad men. And also Gloria Gaynor, or Gloria Graham, sorry. Um, and, yeah, it is just a fantastic noir. It's it's set in New York. It's filmed in, uh, the series are filmed in New York. So it's really got this great 19, like 50s New York feel to it. Um, no, it's it's really, really fantastic. And you kind of forget that Robert, because Robert Wise directed everything from the freaking Sound of Music to um, the Body Snatches from 1945, you forget what act- when he could actually turn out a movie. Um, all those, both those movies I mentioned are fantastic, by the way, but it is, The Odds Against Tomorrow is a fantastic movie. Yeah, this, because we, let's see, Lindsay, did we, re- did we do Force of Evil this year? I think it was this year, yeah. When you when okay, I saw so it on the on the list, I was like, "Oh, I'm doing that one." <laughs> no yeah. one knows what this movie is, but I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, Odds Against Tomorrow, and I I watched that last year. But yeah, God, that Belafonte. Kind of speaking of the Black Klansmen, it's this you know, it's racial tensions are high in the '60s type of thing where yes, it very much yeah. Robert Ryan doesn't want to do the bank robbery if a black guy is going to be on his his crew, right? And it's. Mm-mm. Man, it is so tense. What a great movie, yeah. Yeah, and the fact if he could get out of his own way and not be such a racist piece of shit, the actual bank job could have gone well. But right. it's kind of, yeah, it's got a lot of that kind of going on the undertone with it and everything's so well acted. There's this moment where Harry, Belaf- Harry Belafonte gets drunk and kind of inserts himself into a shot where he doesn't belong and it's kind of, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lance, your first pick. Okay, I've been talking about this movie on and off oh, for a while. It yeah, it's big. It's, <laughs> okay. it's big guns. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> he said like five words, and Erica's like, "Oh yeah, I know." <laughs> <laughs> I think every time I mentioned it, I'm going to be all. It's going to be on my best of list. I like, think any time hmm. that we watch anything Italian, there is someone connected somehow to this movie. So it, there's a way to bring yeah, it up. It's true. Yeah, and the main connection here is Rosa Bonieri has a small part. Of course, yeah. yes. Uh, so I, I watched this in January, early in the year, when I started watching stuff for uh, Smile Before Death, um, directed by Duccio Tesari. He, you know, he he also I also watched A Pistol for Ringo. Rose yeah. Albanier yeah. is not in that, mm. but I have so I, that that was very close to making my list. Actually, oh, okay. that comedy western is ridiculous. He's like dumb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we're talking about big guns. Uh, it's also known as Tony Arzenta, which is uh, the lead character's name, played by the incredibly handsome mm-hmm. Elaine Delon. Calm mm-hmm. down, Lance. Calm Oof. down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Rose Albanieri, Elaine Delon. Good Lord. I mean, yeah. hello. Yeah, of course it's going to be just, on the best of the list. I just want to watch that happen. All the be- <laughs> just all the beautiful people. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful people. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's a basic gangster thriller plot. Uh, Delon is like one of the best hired hitmen in northern Italy, and he decides he wants to do his last job, get out of the game. Uh, usually there is a protocol for this to happen, but Delon's character, uh, Tony Arzenta, he knows way too much about the biggest bosses, and they're all kind of freaked out about all the information he holds, and so they decide to kill him. But they accidentally kill his wife and child. Yep. So... Mm. Revenge time, John Wick. You know, I, this it's a familiar reused plot, but the writing is by uh, Ugo Libatori, and he takes it to these surprising places, uh, especially the end, which I won't bring up or discuss specifically. But Libatori wrote screenplays for Damned in Venice, which we we covered, Corbucci's The Hellbenders, Mill of the Stone Women, Damiano Damiani's The Witch, 
So he knows what, what he's doing and he definitely elevates what could be a boring plot and story. And that's how it is in big guns. Like when you, when it starts, you're like, Oh, okay. I, I know exactly what this is, mm-hmm. but you know, Elaine Delon's in it. So I'll watch it. And so is Rosalba Neri. So I'll take my pants off when I watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's exactly the, the Lance yeah. gives this three and a half boners. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, not not just the story and the pacing's great. Um, you know, obviously the cast uh, kept me fully captivated, and the look of the film. It's the cinematographer is um, Silvano E. Pauletti. Uh He did Smile Before Death and uh, Corbucci's The Great Silence. Oh, hell yeah. oh shit! Uh, Navajo mm-hmm. Navajo Joe. So he, you know, he's a pro. He's gorgeous, mm-hmm. and this and Big Guns looks gorgeous too. Uh, but other cast members, like you said, whenever anybody's mentioned. In our podcast, usually it's an Italian actor. I'm like, big guns. <laughs> Silvano Tranquilli, yep, is, he is. he's in everything. Uh, Erica Blanc is in yeah. big guns. Uh, Richard Conte is in there. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I love this movie. It's streaming on Tubi. I think it has a German Blu-ray release, but uh, I'd love to see somebody like release this and more eyes on it because it doesn't have a lot more of more eyes, less pants. Let's do this, folks. <laughs> more hashtag more eyes, less pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just watched another uh, movie from the first years of lead box set from Arrow the other night, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Why haven't I fucking sat down and just like binged all of these?" Because Italian crime movies are just God. They're so great. Mm-hmm. They're so fun. They really are. Yeah. And I know we had talked about this too, Erica, how you felt it was kind of a stretch with DeLon playing an Italian hitman. He is, he is so <laughs> French. Come on. <laughs> yeah. But it works somehow. You, you think it works, but it does. Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> you could, you Look, I'll believe anything DeLon says to me, but I'm not going to believe that he's Sicilian. I'll, I'll just, I'll <laughs> wink and be like, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Slowly taking your pants yeah. off. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. She's, yeah. <laughs> 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 what about you, Eric? What's your first best of? Yeah, let's let's get depressed, y'all. Yeah, yes, oh my yes. God. Here we go. Do this. This is this. Anthony. We're gonna end on Erica too. We're Hello. gonna go home and just cry. Yeah. Oh wait, I gotta I gotta move one around. Then I'm gonna do the super <laughs> depressing one for last. Okay, cool. Oh, love us, um, love a depressing. Movie. I got some sad Vember yeah. movies for you, yes. Anthony. Yes. Um. So my first pick is called "Quiet Is a Night" from 1978. This is a Polish film. So I'm going to butcher the director's name, Tadeusz Chmielewski. I discovered a new website this year, 35mm.online, which is a site for Polish films. You can watch them for free. They have English subtitles. It's part of this arts project that they have to make films free and accessible for people to watch. So this is a psychological detective story about a police hunt for the murder of young boys happening around Christmas time. The police commissioner who is hunting down the the murderer, he's also having issues with his son at home. So he's just having issues communicating with his son. And um, so his son is like kind of nerdy, but he's also trying to be rebellious. He's trying to connect with his father. And so he's trying to kind of help with the case and learn about it. And so he's kind of poking around in the father's business with that. And so, but eventually like those two equal subplots, those both converge, like the conflict at home with his son and the hunt for the murderer who's going after young boys all converge, not in the exact way you would expect though. It's pretty bleak, but it's a really great winter watch. It's very snowy. It's very, you know, dreary. It's just under two hours. Could have been probably like you know, 90 to 100 minutes and been a little bit more effective as far as building tension around the killings. But I was still really captivated throughout it. But then like once it got to the last 30 minutes, I didn't even realize how tense I, I was like feeling watching watching the ending. So wow. uh, really good. Quiet as a Night, 1978. I will not try to butcher the director's name again. Y'all can look it up and try to do it yourself. Had, so Erica, Erica, had had you told me about this when you watched it? I don't remember. Okay, because it's it's on my watch list already. Uh, but you're the only one of my letterbox friends that has seen it, and it's not on any lists that I like or follow. Did you leave a review? 
Erica? I don't think was so. Was there a review? Anthony? I mean, I maybe. logged it. So, I mean, maybe Anthony just saw that. No, and no, no review for Erica. Just uh, I, I only do it when I have something, you know, snarky to say. So, <laughs> yeah, I wonder how this ended up on my. This sounds fascinating. This sounds amazing. Super depressing, folks. Happy sad member. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Bleak. <laughs> Anthony, back to you. Hey, you know who I love? I love Marjo Gortner. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk about the movie that started my obsession, and it's the documentary, Marjo, from 1972. Aww, yes. Uh, Excellent. I watched it, believe it or not, for the first time this year. It just thinking, like, because Marjo has... <laughs> He's been such a huge part of my life. It seems like I have been obsessed with him forever, but no, it's only been this year. So I <laughs> guess, let's see, I watched the doc for the first time in fucking April. Anyways, so it, this this is the movie that kicked off my obsession. The, the movie that I think about the most of his is Pray for the Wildcats, which is fucking amazing if you haven't seen it. A uh, great biker movie, great cast. I, I have to include Marjo, and Marjo's probably going to end up on all the lists, the documentary, because, like, like I said, this is the one that that started my obsession. But uh, it's directed by Howard Smith and Sarah Konochin, and uh, they were romantically involved at the time and working for I can't remember what papers in New York, but they came across this guy. And uh, they had known him a little bit, uh, acquainted with him, uh, but decided, hey, let's make a documentary. We're not filmmakers, but let's let's try this out. And so they follow Marjo on his sort of revival. You know, he began, began life as a child preacher. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as he got into his 20s, he sort of broke away from his family and lived life you know he he was a shoe salesman he was a carnival barker i mean the he was uh and slash pimp carnival barker slash pimp unknowingly to him but uh he led this fascinating life and then he like ran out of money and he had a wife and and kids and he needed money so he thought you know what i can go back on the the tent revival circuit because i know i can swindle people from from their money, money. So uh, the doc follows him around, and it's it's completely revealing. And I love that they don't paint Marjo as a good guy. They don't paint mm-hmm. him as a bad guy. They paint him as a flawed human being. Um, and his the monologue, you know, what he's the interview at the end with his wife and and uh, and the dog. You know, he doesn't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. And so he's sort of, you know, in this existential crisis, right? And it's so interesting. And I felt like my heart just, just, I mean, it grew for him. I was like, I love this guy so much. So anyways, I watched it, you know, like 20 times and then watched all of his other movies. And it's fucking great. It is so rewatchable i feel like this documentary is so rewatchable because it's fascinating it's um sobering it will make you angry it'll make you laugh but it's such a great portrait of this incredibly interesting man i love it like it's it's included in uh what's Kay- kayla janice's movie the the folk horror documentary oh woodland stark and Wood- yeah oh. woodland, right woodland stark they mention, I can't remember who does, but they mention Marjo, the documentary and that as sort of a folk horror type of thing, um, which I thought was interesting. I fucking love this documentary. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it was fascinating because I just watched it. What hell was last year, I think. Yeah, last year. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like the scenes of him, like you said, they don't paint him as a good guy or a bad guy, you know, especially when he's sitting in the hotel room, just pouring out bags of cash, like all this <laughs> money that he like confiscated from the people. I think he used the term and yeah. as a child getting $20 a kiss and them sewing pockets into his suit jacket yeah. so he can cram more money. I mean, it's, it is, it's a very, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I love, I do love the doc too. Yeah. A lot. Rewatchable for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
There's the experience where you say you're saved. Then there's the fire baptism when you get the Holy Ghost, and that's the tongues thing. And they love to work people over. You've got to, like, shoot in on this. When you see people gathering around people and start laying hands on and praying with someone, you've got to, like, come in with the camera, too. It's very important because they'll be laying hands on someone, and the poor person will be saying, you know, thank you, Jesus. Now, this is a person that's already saved, but they're getting the baptism. And someone will be standing there going, you know, and the poor person will be standing there and they're not saying anything. Then after a while, about four or five more will gather around and they'll start doing the same thing. You know, come on, speak it out, speak it out. Until all of a sudden, the person will, you know, get so overwhelmed by the thing that they start going, you know, and the next thing, oh, that's it, you've got it. Like they feel good. We got another one, you know. Then they'll go on to the next person. Uh, Lindsay, next pick. Uh, my next pick is going to be uh, a movie I saw at the Melbourne International Film Festival. It was a retrospective. I was not expecting what I walked into, but that is uh, Joan Hillcoat's Ghosts of the Civil Dead. Uh, Joan Hillcoat is a director who is known for the likes of The Road, uh, The Proposition, uh, Lawless, many co- collaborations with Nick Cave, which Nick Cave does uh, show up in. Show up in this. It is. Essentially, a story about a prison. It's a prison movie, uh, but you're following kind of one guy played by David Field, and kind of the dehumanization of uh, corporate prisons, essentially. So you sort of start off, he enters prison, and he sort of goes through the system, and it's this kind of very slow process of taking things away from the prisoners and making them more animalistic. Because uh, I sort of said to a friend, oh, I'm going to go see this movie, but we'll catch up afterward and we'll go see another movie as you do in myth because you're seeing three or four movies a, a day. Mm-hmm. And she's and she said, oh, what are you watching? I said, oh, Ghosts of the Civil Dead. And she's like, yeah, you're not going to want to meet up. And no, I didn't. <laughs> it was. Um, I did not go see that other movie. We did not meet up. Um, I was just wanting to stare at a brick wall and just kind of die a little inside. It just It's very slow. It's very mesmerizing. Um, it's a little bit of a harder movie to describe because there is really little plot. It's just this process of watching these people on screen lose any semblance of humanity. And when you start, I mean, they're already in the process of it. I mean, everyone's sort of watching this very violent pornography, especially the violent against women. You already have these kind of things sort of happening and then everything is just pulled away as they try and have more control over it. But when once you realize it, it's because they're trying to turn them into worse criminals, so they'll go back into the into the prison system. It's an amazing movie, but actually a really great Ted Vember movie as well, because at the end of it, you're just like, you're empty. <laughs> yes. Love it. <laughs> yeah. More sad Vember for Anthony. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've I've never even heard of this. And I don't think I've seen a John Hillcoat movie. It, it, oh, I've yeah, seen the proposition. I mean, yeah. The proposition is fucking great. Yeah, this movie's. On, I'm not even too sure where you can get it from because I watched a print of it at uh, the Asta. So if you're ever in Melbourne, definitely Asta's amazing. The next and, time I stop by. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Just a quick trip. Um, but yeah, it's, so I'm not entirely sure. But I, that, and they said it was a rare screening, and I sat down and watched it. And uh, yeah, from the get go, you're just transported into this very sterile, bleak, awful. Um, disgusting world. Uh, Lance or Erica, have, have either of you seen it? No. 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 Adding it to the watch list, though. Oh, yeah. John Hillcoat, yeah. All right, Lance, what about you? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go with something bleak, too. We seem to be kind of on Yeah, a- let's do this. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, I would actually imagine this pick could be on a lot of people's, like, best of new to me 2022, given mm-hmm. its history and its recent release. Out of the Blue, yeah, 1980. Yeah. Oh, Yes. So this is bleak. Uh, it, it was originally released in 1980, but it never really saw a theatrical release. There was a recent, well, a Kickstarter campaign back in 2019 mm-hmm. uh, that was created by Elizabeth Carr and uh, I think her husband, John Allen Simon, who he was originally involved in the distribution of the film in 1980. So he's been right. with this film trying to, you know, get it released for decades, 40, you know, 40 plus years. The crowdfunding was for a 4K restoration and a re-release of the film, and it was supposed to launch at South by Southwest in 2020 at the Paramount. You know, I was actually chatting with Elizabeth Carr. She's like, "Hey, if I send you some postcards, because you know I backed it," and I was like, "Oh, I'm really excited." And she messaged me and said, "We we're going to be at South by. Can I send you some postcards or Mm -hmm. the poster?" I'm like, "Let's do it." And then they started shutting everything down, obviously. Uh, so it was canceled. Uh, since then, Severin became involved. They released it this year uh, or this past year, 2022. It, so it premiered in 1980 at Cannes, and then it was shelled because it was very controversial, incredibly bleak, just raw and rough 
lot of people weren't feeling it. Uh, it was pl- originally planned as a Canadian production, planned to be released as an after school special. Yeah. <laughs> right. So Dennis Hopper uh, was he was already cast to star in it, and the director was fired. So they so Hopper took over. He rewrote the script, making it as again bleak, kind of punk rock, and just brutal, like as fucking po- as fucking possible. Mm-hmm. Like it's. And, and he did that job very well. I mean, there's, there's Dennis Hopper's performance is like amazing in it, but it's all about Linda Manns. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, she plays his daughter, uh, CB and Dennis Hopper. He's in prison. Um, you know, her mother, CB's mother's a drug addict. And we just kind of follow CB as she finds herself in her own voice. And it's, it's not a pleasant journey to watch, uh, especially when, you know, Dennis Hopper gets out of, out of prison and, you know, her mother's still in the picture. It's just, yeah. I mean, I was, I was finally able to watch this at Austin film society. They, they screened it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was so successful here in Austin that they extended, uh, the programming for a few weeks. Uh, everyone should watch it or pick up the seven release because the bonus features are really awesome. I mean, the, I'm always, usually when we do podcasts, I think I spend too much time on production, like the cast and, because I'm so fascinated by how films are made and how they come come to be, and this one especially uh, yeah. with the bonus features and stuff, it, it's worth picking up the seven release. If you spend um, too much time on that stuff, I would cut you off or edit. Yeah, you I would edit. just edit. Like, I, edit <laughs> I would never so even I know. Can cut you yeah. off. Like. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's pair this one with Natural Enemies. Come oh, on, let's, let's have a great night. Oh yeah, let's have a great fucking night. <laughs> Oh man! What stay a, on in this one. <laughs> oh, love natural. I, that, that was one of my first time watches this year too. Mm-hmm. Very mm. close to be on this list. Th- that it was on somewhere in my ten last year when I watched it. Yeah, I bought out of the blue um, in the like in the Friday uh, Thanksgiving sales from Severance. So that oh, is sweet. currently yeah. So because I've heard about this movie for a long time, it was always kind of couched in his redemption movie after um, the last movie, which is a brilliant movie, but I can understand why I confused everyone who, who saw it for the first time. Um, so, yeah, I've been dying to get my hands on this for, for a long time. So as soon as I saw it there, I'm like, I will be taking that one. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Wait until my father gets out of prison. He's going to wipe you out, you motherfucker. Look out! No, no, no! She forgets how young she is. And she wants to grow up so fast. I'm really sorry, you know, that I've been in touch with you, you know. And I don't really have no excuse, you know, because uh, this is where I've been for the last five years, you know. God damn it! Her daddy's coming home. We've got to be a family again. It's my life. I can do what I want with it. Erica. Me, yes. Hi. Fear is the Key, 1972, is my next pick, directed by Michael Tuchner. This is based on the novel by Alistair McLean, wrote Guns of Navarone. I think that's his most famous one, actually. Mm. Yeah, I think that that and Where Eagles Dare, I guess. Anyway, uh, stars Barry Newman, Susie Kendall uh, from Torso. Uh, yes. John Vernon and Ben Kingsley with hair. <laughs> what? Uh, Feels wrong. <laughs> it, it, it's very wrong, actually. This is on Amazon and YouTube to buy, not rent. Um, so I actually ended up renting this from uh, Scarecrow Videos Rent by Mail program. So it opens um, both in the book and uh, in the movie. It opens with the main character, John Talbot, and he is in this shack in the middle of a field. And he's speaking on a radio to his wife, who's on a plane. And we hear some commotion on the other side, you know, on her side of the radio. Um, And then him talking into nothing. And then it cuts to him showing up at a diner, getting in a fight with cops, going to court, and then kidnapping, and then like making his way, like escaping from court or escaping custody and kidnapping the daughter of a millionaire. They go on this really long car chase. Um, they eventually get caught by the father's henchmen and brought back to the house. And I'm going to stop there because uh, if I say anything more about the plot, then it's going to ruin it because it takes 
so many fucking turns. There are so many twists in this movie where it's like, oh shit, that's happening now? Or it's like, oh, that's what's going on? All I'll say about this movie is that it is very much a playing the long game thriller. It's really good. I just actually picked up the novel from Half Price Books and started reading it. So definitely recommend it. Fear is a key 1972. Sweet. Also on my watch list, uh, probably from Pure Cinema. But uh, Yeah, it's been on my yeah. watch list as well. All right, Anthony, back to you. All right, let's do Kung Fu Kid with the Golden Arm from 1979. Oh, nice. Oh, yes. By Cheng Che. And, uh, man, I think this was, so June exploitation, uh, one of the first days was a Kung Fu day and it landed on a Friday, which is when my, uh, column comes out. And so, uh, I was going to recommend five underseen Kung Fu movies and surprisingly little eyes set on kid with the golden arm. 1.9 thousand on letterbox. That's, that's too low for this fucking masterpiece. Hmm. I feel like, man, you know, just lots of cool weapons and, you know, these, what, four or five bad guys and each of them has, has, you know, their theme, right? And then um, there's such a great, the final battle when they've, when, when these guys uh, fight the kid with the golden arm is so fucking fun. And so this year, and I, you know, Unfortunately, haven't gotten any of the Shawscope sets because I don't want to take another mortgage out on my house. <laughs> I just fell in love with Kung Fu this year and this summer in June or probably May watched a shitload of Kung Fu movies. And so it was uh, it, it was between this and Crippled Adv- Avengers, which I watched for the first time also, oh, nice. uh, which yeah. is super fun. But Kid with the Golden Arm, I think it's just a little more fun for me. I don't know. I, I assume everybody has seen this. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it. Yeah. I love it. I love I just watched Crippled Avengers actually for the first time this year. And yeah, that oh, cool. was one of my favorite Shaw Shaw movies I watched this year. Yeah. Love yeah. It. Yeah. I watched so, uh, Eight Diagram Pole Fighter, I think, for the first time this year. And uh, that I was just like, holy shit. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Teeth. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still say Dirty Ho is my favorite Kung Fu movie because the choreography in that is just... It's insane. ...to yeah. die for. But, man, I really wish I could afford those Shaw Scope sets because, God, I would go nuts on those. Um, yeah, I'm still broke. <laughs> but, but thanks you know, thanks, thanks to the internet, you can find almost everything. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I think a lot of those are probably on AeroPlayer right now um if not now then they will be eventually but yeah all right Lindsay, next pick my next pick is actually gonna i'm actually gonna go buster keating um steamboat bill jr uh from 1928 uh this movie is probably most well known for his most famous stunt which is him standing by a house and the front of it just falling down (laughs) when when you watch it you're actually literally going okay how did you not die and everyone (laughs) around him was going Right. Okay. How did you not die? Because just the, when you realize how heavy it is, like I always would have imagined like, Oh, it wouldn't have been that heavy. No, no, no. This is steel and heavy, heavy frames. So he had to know exactly where he needed to stand, but this is a, just a delightful friggin' movie. He is a, a man about town, I guess you would say, who's trying to reconnect with his father, who is a down and dirty uh, boat captain who does not approve of his son's uh, dandy ways. Um, there's romance I mean it's got sort of everything that's just general plot but uh, some of the big stunts yes but some of the things when he's just trying on different hats is still one of the funniest things I've seen it's just the rhythm of it I don't know uh, Erica said it best when she was talking about him but there's just a way that he moves um, mm-hmm. not just the, sto- the stone face but just the way he just absolutely moves and his just reactions to things is just and yeah and they've got wind machines that have him literally off his feet like wind because there's a hurricane at the end and it's just some of those effects are just amazing. And yeah, this a steamboat bill is just a, a pure joy. Yeah. That house fall trick is just, oh. you see it so many times yeah. and you're like, you it, know, it can't be real. Like it's just mm. it's amazing. Yeah. You can see his shoulders kind of flinch a little bit as it's mm-hmm. falling. Um, but that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, dude. Well, he's stone face, not stone shoulders. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
Love it. I'm glad I, there's I, a I would not. I would not be that car again. I would die. No. Yeah. <laughs> Just... Crawl up into a ball and, and die right there. Yes. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Just, Love yeah. it. Uh, Lance. Okay, Killer Crocodile, nineteen eighty nine. Nice. This is oh true. God. This is I'm not. I, this is not a joke, Erica. <laughs> Quit, walk, come back into the room. Where are you going? <laughs> Wait, Gina De Rossi did the crocodile on this one, right? Uh, yeah, he did. He did do the he created tra- like the creature. Yeah. He created the mm-hmm. actual. Okay, I only know this because the kid doesn't die in this one, but it does in the second one because De Rossi directed part yes. two, and the mm. kids die in that one. It, they do, yeah. I, I'll bring up part two in here because so, I did. Okay. I, I watched it immediately after this one. Okay. So this is written and directed by Fabrizio De Angelis, and okay, this is understandably the lowest rated movie on Letterbox from my top list. It, I'm not going to sit here and try and argue that it's saying it's the best movie ever made, and <laughs> there are issues. <laughs> But it was one of the best. I can laugh. I've only seen the second one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you got to see the first one, Lindsay. Oh, yeah. Uh, It was was one of my favorite viewing experiences I had this past year. And I'll I'll set it up. I'm going to set it up. Please do. Fourth of July, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I was eating edibles, okay? Okay, and I just, okay, I, de- I get I it I decided now. to watch nothing but Italian horror that day. I'm like, this is going to be a great day, you know, go America, right? Like, I'm only going to watch <laughs> Italian horror. And uh, Killer Crocodile was the perfect movie for me at that time. Okay. Okay, and I did, I watched, I think I watched Invasion of the Flesh Eaters with John Saxon and Antonio Margheriti. Mm-hmm. And then I, I followed it up with Killer Crocodile too, but... <laughs> Either the edibles have worn off or I'd, it, I don't do, yeah, part two didn't do anything for me. It did have the children. Yeah. Okay, but, mm. uh, but this is written by Dardano Sacchetti. I mean, you're in good hands. Sure. Come on. Yeah. The Beyond, Demons, Bay of Blood, New York Ripper, and yes, Killer Crocodile. Killer Crocodile, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you haven't seen it, you can guess the plot. Toxic chemicals being dumped in a swamp, resulting in a huge fucking killer crocodile. <laughs> Bunch of environmentalists help to stop it. Uh, Richard Crenna's son stars in it. He does. <laughs> it's dumb, but it's like the campiest version of of one of these that I've seen, and that you know, it just it, it all worked for me. Um, I already said the viewing experience was perfect for me. Uh, a lot like when I saw Don't Panic in a crowd in a sell, sold out theater. Yeah. Um, Don't Panic is not a great movie, but no. it was one of my favorite viewing experiences that year. I can see that just the amount of joy I had watching this. Uh, plus you have an original score by Riz Ortolani. So it's a good score. I'll give it that. <laughs> <laughs> Killer crocodile. <laughs> is it, is it the first one or the second one where I think it's the second one? Cause I think I made some joke in my write up about it where like they, about them jumping the croc because like the boat like jumps over the crocodile or something. That's in part two. Yeah. Okay. That is the part two. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's the one thing I remember from it. The part All right. The yeah. Lizzie knows. <laughs> Jump the croc. Because the first one is completely realistic. Like everything yeah. is played with a straight face. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why. Yeah. There's no killer crocodile three because they jumped the croc. In <laughs> You're going to hunt it down and kill it, aren't you? Sure. We're going to kill it, aren't we, Joe? You bet, Judge. Consider it already dead. Uh, okay, so my next pick is The Man Who Stole the Sun, 1979, directed by Kazuhiko Hasegawa. Uh, I watched this on Cave of Forgotten Films or Rare Film with two Ms.com. It's about a high school science teacher who's building an atomic bomb in his apartment. The whole film is very nihilistic. His reason for building the bomb is never explained, and I kind of love it for that because it, it just sort of adds more to the film. It's very, very dark humor. I had this whole thing written up for it for this, for my, you know, in my notes. And then I went on Letterboxd and I saw Brian Holman, the guy I follow on Letterboxd. I saw his review and I just erased everything I wrote. So here's Brian Holman's review on Letterboxd. <laughs> part taxi driver, part Dr. Strange Love through the lens of post war occupied Japan. Yes. That's exactly yeah. what this film is. Um, I love this film. It's gorgeous. It's fucked up. It's funny. It's weird. And uh, everyone should watch it. It's for, you can watch it for free on cave of forgotten films. This watch looks this. amazing. The, yeah. The, I mean, the key art on 
letterbox. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, I, I want to live in this poster. It's so, that's what made like, that's how I found the film is, okay. is like seeing that part on letterbox. And I was like, what is mm. this? I want to watch this. Cause that's the same key art. No, I take it back. It's the same key art that's on Letterbox that is on Cave of Forgotten Films. Gotcha. And so I saw that, like him just glare, like you see his face, like sort of just glaring at this globe in front of him. Mm. And I was like, what is this movie? And I just happened to watch it. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I love this. Thanks. <laughs> I love that fucking site so much. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, maybe if I do Sad November next year, I'm gonna I'm, I'll spend more time on like 35 millimeter online because that mm-hmm. seems like I'll, I'm I'm stereotyping. Not all Polish movies are sad, but every Polish movie I have seen oh, no, is sad. <laughs> so I mean, many many hang, many many Polish films are sad. I can just hang out there, mm. Cave of Forgotten Films. Plenty of sad films there. So yeah. <laughs> they do sad well. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right, Anthony, next pick. Okay, Lindsay. Guess what I'm mm. going to pick? What? It's 1982's Der Fan from Eckhart Schmidt. Yes! <laughs> so I watched this for uh, my column over at F This Movie earlier this year. And then I did a video essay on it. Uh, and then Lindsay's like, hey, you want to do a... I think I, you suggested it because I remember listening to the episode and I'm pretty sure that you suggested the most depressing double feature ever, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, because I don't know if I would have uh, sort of said, hey, let's do Irreversible with, with the fan. But I might have I might have recommended to fan, but I don't think Irreversible would have so, been. Yeah, no, what, what it was, it was, uh, I was, Matt Bledsoe and I were talking about doing a, an episode and I was like, Matt, you've never seen uh, either of these movies what if we do a double feature for your show and it's the first time you've seen them? And he's like, eh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Lindsay, and then I was like, Hey, Lindsay, l- listen to this double feature. And she's like, fuck yeah, let's do it on my show. Yeah. So I, I got to go and talk about the fan and irreversible. Uh, talk about sad Vember. Gosh, I love irreversible real quick. We're not, we're not here to talk about irreversible, but everybody's uh, brief, Opinions on Irreversible? I love it. Love it, okay. I oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I haven't seen it. I love it. I don't I, know. I, I, it'll be five I? years before I watch it again. <laughs> yeah, it's not one on, I'm like, I am going to pop on Irreversible. You know, blah, blah. But yeah, it's, it's one I... Oh, the gas for no, no, I have not. It's one I know that I will rewatch. Uh, I don't think I'm ready to right now, though. Probably in a couple <laughs> years. The, I don't get it. Like, I... Every day I wake up, I'm like, eh, should I watch Irreversible today? Maybe. <laughs> um, but I'm here to talk about Der Fan from Eckhart Schmidt. So I, I had done a column over the past year called 5282, and I reviewed 52 movies from 1982. And Der Fan was one of them as one of the final ones that I had written about. And I had heard about it. And nobody had spoiled it for me, but I, I knew I knew some big some big things. But I still was completely flummoxed and blown away by the film, and just I, I loved it. It was so depressing, and it was so '80s new wave German, and it's I don't know. I I really really like this film. It's one that is is very dark, but I don't know what is what it is about super dark films that I can rewatch them over and over and over. But uh, yeah, I watched it uh, a few times this year because I'm like, yeah, I, I just want to kind of throw on the fan and and chill out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to chill out. No no matter how dark the fan gets, and the the fan gets really, really dark, there's a weird sense of triumph at the end of that movie, which is really fucked up. And I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that kind of feeling toward the movie, but I'm like, oh, no, there's a triumphant feeling, but I'm like, not sure that's a good thing. (laughs) But it's um, it's such a fascinating movie. I really do love that movie a lot. So, yes. (laughs) Yeah, what 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 do you think, Erica? Are you a fan of the fan? 
Yeah, absolutely. I love that movie. Um, mm-hmm. It's one I will watch before I'll rewatch Irreversible. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love it. Uh, Lance, have you seen Der Fan? I have not, no. Oh, okay. I haven't seen Der Fan or Irreversible. I try and stay with Killer Crocs and <laughs> <laughs> Killer Animal movies and yeah, you Rose Albanieri. No, uh, getting familiar with your taste, I'm like, eh, maybe you shouldn't watch this. Der fan and irreversible. Uh, no, Lance. Lance I like would, de- I like depressing bleak stuff. I think you would love Der fan. I don't know how you'd feel about irreversible. I love. I loved. Actually, I really liked climax. That's okay. really the only Gasper I've, I've watched. Okay. Uh, well, fuck it, Lance. Do a Der fan irreversible double feature. Okay. I mean, it sounds like your kind of night. Like that. That's like yeah. that's what you do to wind down. I'm gonna try it. God damn. <laughs> should I be eating anything? Should I or should I just watch no. it? No. Yeah, no. 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 Sober no, and let this, it just wash over you. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm there. Please don't, Lindsay. Please <laughs> tell us you've got something uplifting for your next pick. <laughs> Um, yeah, what am I actually going to pick? I have more than five on this list, which was dangerous. Now I'm just like, uh, what am I going to choose? Actually, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go from a romantic comedy from the 1970s. I'm going for Peter Bogdanovich's uh, What's Up, Doc? Oh, yeah. This, this is just Barbara Streisand just being completely adorable and an absolute Bugs Bunny. I mean, that's what she's playing. Um, Ryan O'Neill somehow working in a movie. Um, and... <laughs> You've got also um, Madeline Kahn just being absolutely amazing and one of the greatest wig jokes I've ever seen in a movie. Um, and maybe has a bit of car chase, then bullet. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Well, I yeah. Lo- <laughs> uh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen bullet in a while, so I do need to re- rewatch mm. bullet, but they do take the piss out of that um, that car chase. Mm. And it's still set in San Francisco as well with, with uh, San Fran with the Hills. But I absolutely adore this movie. This movie is just pure madcap. It's pure silliness. Everything works about it. I fell in love with it. Nice. I watched yeah. um, tough guys. Don't dance. I think, um, God, who put it out. Vinegar syndrome. I think put that out. Ryan O'Neill in that. And that movie is, is something, I mean, Ryan O'Neill is just like ridiculous in that Wingshauser steals it as, as he always does in whatever he's in, but yeah. 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 You know, when, when I was in sixth grade, my uh, English teacher was a huge Barbara Streisand fanatic. And one day we came in and he said, uh, okay, we're going to watch a movie today in class. And so I watched what's up doc when I was in sixth grade. And I was like, Oh, this movie fucking kills. And I've uh, been obsessed with it ever since. It's so, so great. It's so funny. Barbara, I've never been a big, a big Babs fan, but just watching her in this where she gets to be sexy and funny and completely ridiculous. I mean, there is a point where she's eating a carrot and saying, eating What's Up Doc, which is the title of, of the film. I mean, they're not even trying to hide it, but it's just, I mean, and then Madeline Kahn, who tends to play the stuff, which she did a lot of like Young Frankenstein's one of my favorite movies. It's a similar character, but again, she steals the movie right from up, right from under everyone. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's just, it's it's fantastic. It's fun. I loved it. It's uh, not bleak in any kind of way. It, it's a soothing balm after you've watched a reversible in the oh, yeah. van. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do a triple feature. I'm going to do your fan, irreversible, and then follow it up with What's Up, Doc? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, the one, that's the one you can actually finally get your edibles out and just enjoy. That's right. <laughs> Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill in their biggest hit. See Barbara Streisand, see Ryan O'Neill. What's up, Doc? See Ryan O'Neill, see Barbara Streisand. Get out! No, wait a minute! See Barbara light Ryan's fire. I've got to tell you this. Of course you do. See Ryan light his own fire. See the CIA, see the spy. See the spy and the CIA, see the sea. See the Volkswagen get busted. See everyone get busted. I smash my life savers. See what's up, Doc, and see what's up. Yeah. What's up, Doc? From Warner Brothers, rated G. All right, Lance, what do you got next? Okay, I have a Jean Roland movie. Oh, okay. Ooh. The Grapes of Death. Oh hell yeah. Nineteen seventy-eight. This is the first 
year ever I watched it. Anthony, have you? I'm just going to assume you don't like Jean Roulon. Uh No, I, I do like Jean Roland. Oh, but I, I haven't watched uh, a lot. We, I was going to do a bunch. Uh, well, not a bunch, but movies from hell uh, was going to do a whole summer of Roland, and mm-hmm. so I was going to watch stuff along with them. But it fell apart, so I still have it. But what I've seen, yes, I do dig. Okay. Yeah. You surprise me, Anthony. Every day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I hadn't watched a whole lot of his movies. I mean, I'd seen some a couple of years ago, but I had some Kino Redemption blues that I picked up a while back. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to watch them this year. Um, the other one was Fascination, which I love, Lips of Blood, but... Grapes of Death is what did it for me. I mean, like all his films, incredibly atmospheric, super dreamy, gorgeous cast, including Bridget LeHay is in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's about this young woman who becomes trapped in a remote village, and the villagers have turned into these flesh-eating zombies. And their transformation is all caused by the pesticide that's being sprayed on the local vineyards. So it's a completely original take and an idea on like a zombie-type movie. And... You know, it's genre alone, so you know you're going to get, well, a beautiful cast of characters, but mm. just like the the French landscapes and stuff, and it being in like this remote village, it's just it, it very visually uh, engaging, uh, fast paced script, um, a lot of surprises too. I love the way it ends. Um, <laughs> it's it's in the it's been my favorite I've seen from Jean Roland, so I recommend it if you haven't seen it, Anthony. Put it on your watch list. No, I haven't seen Grape. No, yeah, it's been on my watch list. I, um, Roland, like, I don't know, he just had a great eye for beauty. So like you were saying, Lance, the way um, his camera sort of appreciated the female body, it's the same way his camera appreciates these these castles that he shoots in and like the, this these gorgeous... Um, exterior shots and the, you know, these, these beautiful landscapes. Yeah. Um, like he had such a great eye for beautiful things. Yeah. They're and yeah, you're right. They're in every single one of his films, lips of blood, which is the one I think I watched last. Um, and that play takes place like on kind of like a, there's a nice, like a Rocky shore, like a, on an ocean or something. And the yeah. scenes on that are just like, Oh my God, he can film any landscape and, Maybe he decides to film it when it's like cold and August because it just right. looks like such a it's such a feeling like it's yep, absolutely like you need to to put on a, a long sleeve or a jacket while watching his stuff. Yeah, yeah. there's a that documentary that's uh, Cat Ellinger. Oh yeah, and, she's doing uh, the Roland doc. Yeah, Dima Balin, mm. uh, orchestrator of storms, a fantastic world of Jean Roland. Um, I think that just premiered. I want to say whatever the, the festival in England is. I can't remember. Um, oh, the, Fright Fest. Fright Fest. I think it was, I think it premiered there. So I hope it's going to be online soon. If not, I would expect, you know, it to get a release from one of the boutique labels since yeah. she does so much work with all of them. But I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, I have Sam's book too. The genre oh, yeah. collection if you want to yeah. borrow. That yeah, I'd love, I'd love to borrow that. All right, my next pick. Um, talking about one of one of my crushes. We already talked about Elaine Delon earlier, so let's talk about Lee Marvin. <laughs> oh yeah, what? okay. <laughs> Emperor of the North, nineteen seventy three. Um, oh nice. Directed yeah. directed by Robert Aldrich, uh, who did The Dirty Dozen, Longest Yard, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. This has a the long out of print Twilight Time Blu ray or Spanish import Blu ray. So I got this from legal adjacent means. Um, <laughs> this is uh, this has Ernest Borg nine as a train conductor who prides himself on not letting any tramps ride his train for free. And then so you've got Lee Marvin and his character name is a number one. That's it. That's his name like is a number one. And so he's a tramp who sets out to do just that. And so if you're able to ride the rail, um, Ernest Borgnine's train, I think it's train number 17, I don't remember. Um, You're considered, you're emperor of the north. This The final battle at the end between the two is something. Like the plot is very simple. It's Lee Marvin and Ernest Borgnine just going back and forth with each other as Lee Marvin, they each try to like outwit one another so Lee Marvin can ride the train. 
Marvin uses a chicken as a weapon at one point, and good lord, <laughs> if that yeah. is not the sexiest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm. <laughs> wow, is he just swinging it by the neck, or what is? I he? don't want to spoil it okay. for anybody. <laughs> Everyone's got their it's own things, you know. It's my own. Mm-hmm. It's my own thing, you know. Just let me let me watch Lee Marvin use a choke his chicken as a. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. As she's as she's unbuttoning her pants. That's right, Lee. Pick up that chicken. <laughs> yeah, I mean, shit. You know what's been the greatest thing about quarantine is I, you know, wearing pants that don't have zippers or anything. Pull really. <laughs> straight down. Ready to their rip away or tear away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just easy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Emperor of the North, 1973, super great 1970s, Ernest Borgnine, Lee Marvin at his peak sexy drunkenness. Nice. Love it. No, I, I, I do love this movie. It's great. Yeah. I went through a Lee Marvin phase last year and this has came up and that's, I'm, yeah, you're right. It's, there's a lot of to love. There's a, that's a great phase to go through. I would like to, mm. I would like to go through one myself. Andy. <laughs> yes. My pants also disappear with the Lee Marvin <laughs> thing. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, it's just like, where's my pants? Yeah. I think we're all, you, are we all naked at this point? I mean, we should be. Uh, Lindsay, have you seen the movie with Lee Marvin and Toshiro Mufune? I think it's um, Hell in the Pacific. Yes. Oh, yes, my I God. Have. If that's yeah. not like, I mean, that's just like everything comes off in that movie. Oh, it does. You're just watching these two very hunky men just like hanging out in an island. I'm just like, well, it's, it's, I'm done. Yeah. They're just yelling at each other. Lee Marvin's like, that's my log. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the hottest thing. <laughs> oh, dear. It's already. It's already. I take my pants off for Ernest Borgnine, so. <laughs> Whatever okay. floats your boat, man. Uh, yeah. Borgnine as a bad guy, you know, when. I was, I only knew Borgnine as sort of like the goofy older guy for a long time. And then, then I think I saw Bad Day at Black Rock and then Johnny Guitar real close mm-hmm. to each other. I'm like, oh my God, he plays a real piece of shit really well. And uh, realized, oh, he was like a bad guy almost all the time in these older movies. Mm. So good. A number one. A man who lives by his wits. I'm trusting you, kid. Cover for me. Hey, you come back here! He takes what he needs and goes where he wants, and always travels first class. You confess, sinner. The Lord is my tabernacle. And his ship is filled with gold. He sets out for the pearly gates. Hallelujah, brother! A number one has been everywhere, but never on the number 19, Shack Strait, where nobody rides for free and lives. Uh, where are we at? Oh, last picks. Anthony. Last one for me. Okay, so I I was going back and forth. I'm not going with this one, but I finally watched Untold Story this year. Yay. Same. And, uh, oh, you watched it for the first time too, Lance? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, everybody's right. Erica, you, you picked it for one of our shows over at Cult Movies. And yeah, it's fucking great. It's amazing. Yeah. But... The one I'm going to go with, I watched this in, uh, oh, for June Sploitation. It's called The Mission, directed by Johnny Toe from 1999. And it's Anthony Wong. It's Jackie Louis Ching, uh, Chung Yin, Roy Chung, uh, Simon Yam. I mean, like, every everybody's in it. They all play assassins. A triad boss is he's escaped like one or two assassination attempts. And so he hires these other assassins to protect him. And of course, like, you know, assassins being very solitary figures, they have to sort of learn to work together and they develop little signals when they're out, you know, moving him around uh, from, you know, building to building, hideout to hideout. And the camaraderie between all these guys was... Uh, so unexpectedly moving, you know, because so like when one of them gets shot, like it affects all of them emotionally. And these guys, you know, Anthony Wong, who is one of the scariest looking people like ever. uh, And he plays these terrifying characters, uh, which he's doing here in the mission he has like this emotional connection with these other guys and it's so cool to see. Uh, but also it's fucking badass. Like people shooting at each other constantly. It's, 
It's a, you know, a triad movie. And, uh, oh man, it is so fucking cool. You can stream it on Canopy if your library is hooked up with Canopy, but mm-hmm. that's how I watched it. Nice. So the mission from 1999, highly recommend this one. I'm very conflicted on this one because Laird gave this four and a half. Lars said, nearly perfect. I could watch this five times in a row. John gave it two and a half stars, though. And John and I are usually pretty closely aligned. So I'm, I, but I've got like, you know, three people that I know saying yes, and then John. So maybe John was in a bad mood that day. I'm going to say that. John was in a bad mood that day. <laughs> I mean, how can you go wrong with that cast? Like, it's, mm. it's like, uh, Hong Kong All Stars. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's super super fun. It looks like it's only under ninety minutes. It's under ninety minutes too, which yeah. is sounds incredible. Yeah, it's super short. What does it say eighty one minutes? Yeah, eighty one minutes. Incredible. Oh, yeah, it yeah. flies yeah. by. I think I put this on my watch list after I saw you watch it, so I need to get on it. Great, great movie. Nice. I'm gonna check canopy when we get off here. And John is wrong. Just make sure he knows that. I'll, I'll let him know. When you guys go look for dead bodies, just tell him, John, you're wrong about the mission. Uh, he just heard you. He's in here bringing uh, Erica more pants. <laughs> in a pile of pants right next to me. I needed more. They just torn off. I hit my little dumbbell. <laughs> more pants. <laughs> All right. Lindsay, last pick. I think I'm going to go marry a barber for my last pick. And that is Shock, a.k.a. Behind oh, yeah. the Door 2 from 1977. I think this is his last theatrical uh, movie before he passed away, sadly. Barry Baba is is the best. Um, but, yeah, this has the amazing uh, Daria Nicolodi uh, with her. Again, this is a, with an annoying kid, but I take this always with Italian movies when there's a, a kid. Um, but her son moved back into the house, she said, with her past deceased husband, and things start to go awry. But what I wasn't expecting um, from this movie is how surreal this gets. I mean, Barb is throwing every single trick at this at this movie, and it is phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has John Steiner in it too. And, oh, yeah, but yeah. Anything with yes, Dario yeah. and Lodi. Oh, I love yeah, her so yeah. much. There's oh, a- she's so, so great. Again, RIP. Which, yeah, mm-hmm. she's amazing. Yeah, I need to revisit this one because the, the kid, I remember, just really – was grating on me. And, uh, you know, when, when there's a kid like that in a film and I'm not having a good day, then my experience viewing it suffers. But I do, I mean, I remember a lot of really great things about this, particularly like one scene where she's in the hallway and he's running at her. And then all of a sudden, like, I I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but there's like one scene that's like better than any jump scare you can get out of any modern day movie ever. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I rewound it five times trying to figure out how we did it because I couldn't see the, where, the, where the thing was. I'm like, how? Yeah. <laughs> how? It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we, I, I did an episode on uh, Black Sunday back in October, I think. Hmm. And so watched uh, some more Bava. He's my second most watched director. But, uh, yeah, I watched Shock. I watched Whip in the Body and Hatchet for the Honeymoon. But you, Shock. I think was my favorite of the bunch that day. I watched four. I can't remember what the other one was, but mm. good fucking movie. Yeah. He's a director. I tend to only watch one or two a year. Cause I just want to savor him. I don't, I'm not looking forward to when I get to the end of his filmography and I have no more Mario Barber. So I tend to space him out quite a bit, but yeah, shock was mine for the year. And I was just like, ah, oh, this is so good. <laughs> nice. nice. That's smart. Let's last pick. All right. Last pick. Uh, another killer animal. Venom from 1981, directed <laughs> by Piers Haggard. We did Blood on Satan's Claw. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> have y'all seen this? Is this the one with Venom? Oh, no. and- yeah, I have, yeah. Me, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. this movie. Yeah, I mean, I- Valdez McCoy told me to watch this movie, and I did, and this movie's amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I thought I had watched it before, but as soon as I started watching it early in the year, I was like, I – yeah. I definitely have not watched this and I can't stop watching it. This is amazing. I obviously popped it on because of the cast. You know, you already said Oliver Reed, Klaus Kinski, yeah. uh, mm. Sterling Hayden, Hayden mm-hmm. is in this. Um, and he could be a very monotone, stoic actor. And his, he's. Yes, you know, but is he a good actor? I think. <laughs> yes. I think he's. Um, I think he's one of the best actors in Venom. He plays uh, like. So he, he gave me uh, one of my favorite performances. 
is Grandpa Chapman from Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? He has very little words. Will yes. Hare. Will, Will Wasn't Hare that your profile him. picture for a while? It, yeah, I, I use that. I use that. Wait, right. was that Sterling Hayden? No, 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 it wasn't. That was Will oh. Hare. But uh, yeah. uh, yeah, Sterling Hayden in Venom reminds me of that of Grandpa Chapman. He's got the same. Oh, he kind of, yes. <laughs> kind of the same kind of grumbling, like, what do you do? You know, just not really caring mm-hmm. much, but trying to scare his, his grandchild. So he, he, Hayden plays a retired wealthy man. And some international terrorists, obviously led by Kinski, they attempt to kidnap his grandson. And the setup and the planning for the kidnapping is really fascinating and fun as hell to watch because it's a it's complicated situations all lead to the unraveling of all these plans. Oliver Reed plays the butler of the rich family and he starts helping out the kidnappers. So there's there's there is like this humor going on. It's it has funny elements. But the main hiccup in this plan is the kidnapped boy who had just purchased a pet snake, but the pet shop was mis- <laughs> it was mistakenly delivered a black mamba, which was supposed Jesus to be shipped to a toxicologist. So that escapes and starts just screwing up everyone's plans. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it's so good. The end is amazing. Like it starts turning into like die hard. There's so many different genres that are mixed in with this. <laughs> Uh, the twists and turns throughout it's, it's a wild plot, but everybody plays it straight and it, it stays like realistically thrilling while going off the rails when it needs to. In my letter, letterbox review, I added drink every time that Klaus Kinski says we have the boy. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, if you haven't, if you haven't watched it, do that. Let me know how that works out, but uh, okay. it's so good. It there's is a so moment. Good. Where, yeah. There's a moment Klaus Kinski. I think he's yelling outside of the police. Mm-hmm. Um, I still don't know what he says. Like he's just <laughs> yelling nonsense. <laughs> he goes, "Hey, policeman!" and then just says something. I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. This movie is wild. It's it's so entertaining. <laughs> it is, and it, I think it is because there's so many. I don't know. Like I, I can't really put a, a, a category to it. Like it's kind of horror. It's definitely action. It has these weird comedy elements. It's just so bizarre. I know everyone is going to be very surprised about this but kinski and reed did not get along oh. during the filming <laughs> of this can you believe can you, that yeah can you I'm imagine being so on that surprised. set uh, <laughs> jesus, jesus. I, yeah. no the they're essentially were stealing hating probably getting drunk in the corner as well yeah, oh my god, oh my god. Lot the time. god I yeah i drunk seen. oliver reed just like just <laughs> I mean, even if you're not drunk, just staring and watching Klaus Kinsey yeah. sometimes perform, knowing who he is, and like you're like, God, I want to yeah. fucking break that guy. Like, I think Reed and Hayden probably <laughs> got along okay because, like, once Reed finds another drunk, he's like, Oh, you're okay, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But like, it was what was the book called? Uh, like Hellraiser, the Hell Life and Inebriated yeah. Times. Yeah, like, and they wrote about this one. Like, there's a blurb about it. It's like, yeah, they didn't get along. <laughs> It's like, well, obviously, those no two shit. weren't going to get along. Anyway. Last movie, Erica. Last movie. All right. Let's, uh, let's fuck some people up here. Yes. The Noisy Requiem, 1988. This is another one that I watched on Cave of Forgotten Films, uh, Japanese, directed by Yoshihiko Matsui. I'm going to be lazy and read the letterbox synopsis. In the slums of Osaka, various marginalized misfits have their own interpretations of love. Completely alienated from the outside world, they commit sexual perversions, violence, and cannibalism. Mm. So it's kind of like a slice of life. You're following different sets of people with varying degrees of degeneracy. But at the core of this, all of them are looking for love and acceptance just in very unconventional ways. There's one man who brings a mannequin to the roof and starts pretending like that's his girlfriend and even having sex with her and cutting out a hole in her crotch for that. The mannequin does eventually get pregnant and a little, hang on, I know, and a little, but well, she doesn't have the baby because a little person comes along and cuts open her midsection and pulls the fetus out. And then the little person takes the fetus, like swinging by the umbilical cord, takes it out on a little tour through the city and they go to like a pachinko parlor. Wow. Super fun movie. Immediate guys. watch list. It's beautifully shot in black and white. Definitely, I'm not trying to oversell it because this is definitely not going to be for everyone. There are some very uncomfortable scenes, particularly 
uh, the way that one little girl dies in this is probably even for me, I was like, Ooh, I think we, we crossed the line there, but it is gorgeous. I think it is a really interesting way to look at how people are so desperate to find connections and love and the, the extremes that they will go to, but that within their own world and their context, this is all completely normal to them. So that's I a great, it. yeah, that's, that's a great final movie. I, I'm not wearing it any is. pants right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You have broken Anthony. Everyone, everyone is pantsless. Yes. We've had a yes. successful episode. <laughs> it's a perfect way to end this year. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say mannequin fucking unzip? Okay. <laughs> well, as soon as you started talking about the mannequin getting pregnant, I was like, so you're telling me I got to stop fucking mannequins. Like, <laughs> I mean, if you're practicing safe sex, I think you should be fine. But well, um, Lance only only barebacks mannequins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't. I didn't cut I'm a kidding. hole in them. But it's, it's, <laughs> I'm keeping it. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. I was gonna say, yeah, I was gonna say, oh, Peter Strickland's seen this movie, and then little person takes out fetus. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe not. <laughs> oh, also, it's 150 minutes long. It is a long movie. That's a wow. lot of mannequin fucking. It's <laughs> that is. It's not all mannequin I know, fucking. No. I mean, there's other people. Now you. I mean, you yeah. sold it for me. I, I, it sounds mm-hmm. great. I, I I highlighted the most out there things for, for so people can be like, that's for me, or wow, Erica is fucked up, and that is not for me. <laughs> so um, I bring that up for that reason. But again, getting back to, <laughs> you know, it is a gorgeously shot film, um, and in black and white. So definitely. Definitely recommend it. Again, that one's on Cave of Forgotten Films. So we will have a list put together of all 20 of these movies for everyone. This will be in, uh, we'll post a link to that in show notes so everyone can reference that quickly. I'll have a note next to it on whose was everybody's pick. Uh, Anthony, tell folks where to find you and follow Cult Movies. Uh, Cult Movies is on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Cult Movies Pod. And you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at AK Donnelly. That's A K D O N E L L Y. And then um, if if you so choose, we have a Patreon at patreon.com backslash cult movies podcast. Lindsay, what about you? Uh, you can find uh, Schlock and Awe on all major apps, I'm pretty sure. Uh, also, you can find me on the usual social medias at Schlock and Awe 1, uh, depending which ones will remain and which ones will stay. And also, if you can follow me at Reading Geek as well um, at, on Twitter. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find me. <laughs> Sweet. So you can find Unsung Horrors on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow me on Letterboxd and Instagram at Hex Massacre, uh, Discord, Hex Massacre 2790. I'm on Instagram and Letterboxd at L Shibe. Lindsay and Anthony, thank you so much for coming back and sharing your picks again with us this year. Yes. Hell yes. Loved it. Love, thank you so much. <laughs> love doing these end of year shows. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay, you have any, uh, Anthony mentioned he's doing some for his podcast, plus a list on F This Movie. Do you have any plans for any other episodes like this either for yours or any other guest spots you're doing uh yeah i might be going on dirk's vhus for a top 10 of the year and also another five discoveries i'm pretty sure i should nail that down um but i haven't planned anything for my uh for shock and all yet but you never know so i might just do something kind of random and go hey guys i kind of need to talk about some of the movies that i love (laughs) there you go love it well folks be on the lookout for that check out cult movies podcast as well as schlock and awe uh, you probably you'll be seeing us over on Cult Movies pretty soon to talk about another Roger Corman movie. Yes. <laughs> and other than that, we will see you next year, and we'll be kicking it off for Giallo January. Yes. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye.
You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening.